Hello, hello all. We have an intriguing and fun stream planned for you today. But first, if you missed the creative challenge with Kathleen Martin, you can catch that first um, week of replays every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific. So go ahead and check those out. And today, have you ever wondered how to add movement to your photography or even bring your designs into augmented reality? We have a treat for you. Uh, we are joined by multidisciplinary artist, Gabriella Yanku, who combines product, photography, motion, design, and get this, this is a real clincher, uh, and augmented reality. Um, and I'll be your host. I'm Carrie Gotch, the community manager for Adobe Aero, uh, Adobe's augmented reality authoring platform. And if you happen to be on uh, YouTube right now, please go ahead, hop on over to uh, Behance Live, where I will be moderating the chat. So you can plug in your questions for Gabriella there, and uh, we'll make sure that we get those answered for you. And uh, now, uh, Gabriella, uh, go ahead, let me know, uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about yourself. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me and for the introduction. And thanks to everyone who's uh, tuned in uh, to see this session this afternoon. Um, yeah, so I am a multidisciplinary artist, as you mentioned. It's really hard, actually, to put a title behind a um, variety of things that I do. Uh, you know, my portfolio is really packed with a lot of interesting uh, projects that rely on creative technology. Um, so right here, you, you can see my, my page. I actually started with photography back in 2009. I was a self-taught photographer at the time. And um, photography has been my first um, love. Uh, later on, I got to uh, study uh, photography at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. So I perfected my craft and um, Pretty early on, I started um, incorporating motion into photography. And here you can see a few cinemagraphs that I did um, actually with a session with Adobe Live um, this January. So you can um, go back and watch it and see how I create my cinemagraphs. And for those of you who are not really familiar with what a cinemagraph is, it's basically a hybrid of um, a still image and a part of a motion that loops perpetually. So they are quite mesmerizing. Um, and um, as you can see here, I have a lot of appetizing food. <laughs> My photography style is uh, really centered around this um, idea of uh, recreating still lives uh, with a contemporary touch. And um, as someone that doesn't really go out to find these scenes in the real world, I spend lots of time in my studio trying to come up with concepts to create these scenes um, here in my home and bring them to life in a way that feels more innovative. Um, so I spend lots of time on conceptualizing, finding the storyline, finding the props, what are the props saying? What are the colors that I need to bring this story to life? And eventually incorporating some um, elements of motion into it. And uh, today, I guess we are going to have a very interesting session um, really centered around this idea of how we can make um, interactivity and animation easy. And here I will be using lots of applications. Hopefully that will not speak you out because <laughs> there are a lot. I will be going through Photoshop, um, After Effects, uh, Dimension, and then eventually reach Arrow, uh, Adobe's augmented reality app, which is really cool. And I'm going to show you how we can bring still images to life, similarly to these cinemagraphs that we see here, but um, with a twist. And um, let me show you a few more of these cinemagraphs that I create because I'll be taking a lot of inspiration from this, thinking about how the movement should be in uh, the final AR experience that you will be seeing later on today and um, trying to recreate this um, mesmerizing feeling with um, static images and um, AR. 
These are beautiful. I love these. And they're also making me really hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Carrie. Yes, they are. Um, you know, Coca-Cola, of course, or Pepsi, Pepsi Cola, they will, you know, seeing these ads, uh, you'll get thirsty or seeing cakes, you'll really crave something sweet. So, um, you know, the idea behind my photography, it has always been to it create this feeling of craveability and um, make photography a bit more immersive. So I hope that I will succeed showing you today my techniques and you will feel inspired and get started with these um, uh, new techniques in your own work and see how you can, you know, make animation be really simple. Yeah, I've been really stoked and excited about this stream for this reason, because your still lives have all packed all that information in like a small scene. And then when you add that motion, they become not so still lives or these cinemagraphs that are just so engaging and they really create some scroll stopping content. Like when I see <laughs> yes. this is something very different and something very novel, but there is that nod to some of the old masters of uh, still lives. So this is very exciting. Yes, it is scary. And let me tell you one thing. Initially, when I started with Cinemagraphs, that was back in 2013, I was studying as CAD. It was in my Photoshop class. So of course, I was experimenting with lots of things. Um, but I was calling these Cinemagraphs living stills. <laughs> Just because, you know, they are not quite still, but then, you know, you have the surprise of this moment that kind of catches your eye, you know, holds your attention and you're kind of become an active part of the story. So that was the idea behind when I uh, started thinking about how I can make my photography be a bit more immersive. And that was the first step in this very long journey. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, I see that we have a lot of people tuning in from all over. Um, we had Ferry turning, uh, tuning in from Indonesia. We had someone else um, tuning in from Virginia. Anyone else want to give a shout out of uh, where you're tuning in to the stream from today, go ahead and plug that in the chat. And if you happen to be on YouTube, get over to that Behance Live so we can uh, talk to you in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, feel free to place them in there and I'll be asking uh, Gabriella throughout her stream. Perfect, sounds good. All right, so let me go ahead and jump into Photoshop. So um, let me just walk you through the game plan for today. Basically, we'll be turning these um, photograph of this class into an AR experience. And I will need to take a few steps to make that happen. And I will go through a few apps. So just recreate that motion that I want the final AR experience to have. And um, I really want this to be really simple to encourage everyone who's tuned in to, to start get started with this. And this photograph is really not much, but it's the beginning of something that we'll see later on towards the end of the stream will become a really, really immersive experience. Um, so I shot this glass at home. Um, I used the studio light here on the left. It's nothing um, too exciting about the shot right now, but we will making stand out, uh, make it stand out pretty quickly. So just a few specs on how, why I style this in this particular way and why it's looking like this. First of all, I'm shooting flat. That means that I want to have the latitude once I import my assets from the computer to do the color grading and you know exposure correction in a way that gives me more space. So I'm shooting flat, the colors look desaturated, but we'll bring those back uh, with a few tweaks. Then um, the glass is sitting atop of another glass because I, I have a very specific reason in mind for that. Finally, in the AR experience, this glass will be filled with a cocktail, some sort of liquid that will be very slowly and gently moving inside the glass, really wavy type of liquid, onto which we will see a reflection of our galaxy. And get that, then we'll have some very nice planets orbiting around this glass. So everything will be really exciting and you know, I want this experience to have that almost cosmic, celestial type of vibe. And I will need to take a couple of actions to make that happen. And the first one will be to just, you know, mask this glass out of this background. Um, I shot it against this blue background just because I wanted the glass itself to have 
this sort of blue reflections. And this paper that I put behind it here, again, for the same reason, just the stem of the glass to catch those glimpses of uh, this blue gradient. But um, enough talking, let's just get to work. <laughs> I'm just gonna use the pen tool really quickly. I really love the pen tool. Um, typically is the first tool that I'm using in Photoshop each time I need to do an action. Um, I'm just very quickly gonna mess this out. Let's see, like this. And if you are just getting started with Photoshop, you know, I think um, you should experiment with a pen tool. I know a lot of people kind of don't like it because they find it a bit more difficult to use, but I think it's a very great tool to mask out objects in a very precise way. So I really love it. I feel like I can uh, do my masking pretty quickly with it is I don't feel like it's slowing me down just because I have to take all of these clicks and you know draw the outline of the object so let's see I'm amazed by your steady hand here <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah um you know I let me tell you a story behind how I first started using the pen tool because I hated it at the beginning too. But, you know, you end up in life going through different kinds of experiences and then you, you are kind of forced to start working in a particular way or discovering tools in Photoshop. So I was doing an um, internship, a photography internship with Atlanta Magazine in, in Atlanta. And of course, for a magazine, they need lots of um, objects to be cut off of their you know, backgrounds and then put in the magazine layout. So that's how I started. I was practicing so much for the magazine. And uh, by the end of the summer, I knew how to use the pen tool. So that's the um, miracle behind it. <laughs> yeah, practice makes perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, always. And we are almost done. So the next step after I'm going to finish with this um, path will be to color correct the glass. So I want this glass to have really deep blue uh, tints, um, almost like, you know, when you look up to the sky, you see all of those gorgeous colors. Um, so I want this to have really vibrant color palette and we are going to do that pretty quickly right now because I'm almost done. Okay. Now let me go. Yeah, if we're gonna have an interstellar uh, cocktail, we better make it cosmic. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right, so I have this ready. I just took it out of the original background. I'm gonna disable this. So let's see. So now we have our glass. Looks pretty good at this point. Uh, so the next thing, so let, let's see how we can make these um, colors to pop up a little bit better. So for this, typically I'm using just color balance, really make it simple, nothing too fancy. And just, um, you know, play with the sliders and see where the colors take you. And I kind of know exactly how much I need to put in here just to make that color really vibrant. And we'll do this in two steps. So the first step of course is enhancing the blues and the second step is enhancing the yellows. We see that the glass has um, the, the golden rim. So we need to make that yellow pop as well because right now it's like the blue is overtaking. Um, but I would say, looks pretty good right now. And we can always go back and tweak it in case we feel like, oh, this is too blue or it's not blue enough. And let me create another adjustment layer for yellows. Oh, and you know, we can then go back and just use a brush and take out the blues from, you know, the yellow part just to make that yellow stand a bit more. Let's add a bit of red in as well. Okay. 
So let me just go and paint with a brush. So right now I'm just taking out the blue tint that happens to be overlay on top of this rim. And maybe um, I can drop my opacity here and like just very slightly, maybe less let the blue shades in here come through as well and right now we can paint with yellow over this golden rim and you know it's just slightly it's gonna change it's not gonna be like very big difference but i think the difference that is making it's big enough for me especially because i know how this glass looks in real life so I just want to have all these beautiful colors blend together nicely. So you can see like I'm turning this off. You can see that already is coming through and we can see the mask in case we want to really make it more refined. But I'd say it's looking pretty good right now. Yeah, that looks but, great. Yeah. I love the contrast on that and the complementary colors that you're going yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it seems like the per precision and the subtlety and this like attention to details that you're doing here really makes all the difference with these um, cinema graphs that you make. Yes, thank you, Carrie. Yes, I think, you know, a little goes a long way. And I, I like to think that my work, it's pretty subtle just because I feel like with cinema graphs, there is like an imaginary border that you don't want to cross. You don't want your cinema graphs to become too um dynamic like there is a difference between a cinemagraph and a video if it's too much motion then it's not a cinemagraph it's just a short video and also i like to keep my cinemagraphs to be pretty um photography or like to still maintain the photographic nature like at the base you know a cinemagraph is still an image it just has these subtle moments of motion that are embedded throughout that you just want to you know be fascinated by so i don't want to overdo it so typically everything i do is pretty subtle okay i think i like it yeah you have the uh, audience feeling fancy so far says bliss <laughs> yeah it's looking pretty gatsby <laughs> um okay so right now i feel like i need just a tiny bit of contrast so i'm gonna use another adjustment layer you know just drawing an s curve just like that before and after i really like to do this before and after just to get a sense of you know how much more i need to go before you know getting to the level that i want to achieve if you feel like you went overboard, you can always go back and tweak the adjustments you did, but I kind of like it for now. Um, let me group these layers so they don't stand in our way. And another thing that I don't want to forget um, that I want to do is, so this will be a 2D image of the glass that we are going to import into Arrow and on Switch we will be uh, applying other levels of uh, animation and interactivity. So I want this glass to kind of have sort of a 3D aesthetic and I'm just going to apply a quick mask. And since it's a glass, you know, you see through it. Yes, it's see through. So I want to just use like a very soft brush, very low opacity and kind of, you know, really nicely kind of paint over the areas that I think, you know, they might catch some highlights like over here and make them a bit more transparent so once we are in arrow and we see this glass in our environment we kind of see the environment coming through the glass so it kind of gives you that um vibe that things look a bit more realistic than they are it's just a little trick that i'm typically using with things like this yeah, and that's interesting that you're even thinking about further down in your workflow really early on. Like, how will this show up in augmented reality and like preparing this for that to then show up in space? Yeah, because I feel like, you know, I'm not a 3D expert. You know, my specialty is photography, but I love this 3D aesthetic that it's kind of coming through right now, especially with AR. And I'm just thinking, you know, is there anything in my 
tool set that I can use to make that experience be more like that without having to go through the hardship of learning 3D because, you know, 3D is hard and it's so time consuming and um, it takes a while to learn it. And before I get there, I just want to be able to, you know, take advantage of the AR technology without being pressured to learn something too quickly. So I'm just using the skills that I know to make that happen in a way that feels maybe innovative. I don't know, maybe, but at least I'm enjoying the process. I think that's the beauty of augmented reality. People can come from any discipline and then create something completely unique and new and then place it in the real world and have that interaction in the real world. So this is this unique wor workflow is really interesting too, like bringing the still lives to life in real life and then placing it over, um, it just, it just tickles your brain a little bit when you watch them. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I hope people don't get too spooked because I'm using so many apps. It's just, you'll see uh, each app is doing their own little thing and it's just helping us to get there eventually with the assets properly prepped for AR. And uh, I think the final experience is going to look pretty awesome. Okay, yeah, it's looking so, good so far. Yeah. <laughs> um, so right now I feel pretty pretty good with how the glass looks. I don't want to overdo it. I can always come back and, you know, tweak things in case I see it later on that is not doing what I wanted to do. But right now I feel pretty good about it. So I'm just going to go ahead and just do a quick PNG export. So I'm going to export it as a PNG because I want um the background to be transparent and all of these you know adjustments we did i want them to come through once we have the final picture so um, we can just export this okay let me create a folder here let's call it live and then this will be my glass Okay, so now we have our class. Our job in Photoshop is pretty much done unless we need to come back later on. But my next step would be to open uh, After Effects and um, I'm gonna show you a pretty quick way and really interesting way to add motion to this class without really needing to know too much about After Effects. So hopefully that will encourage people to get started with After Effects as well, because I know it's a pretty um, big deal to get started with After Effects. It's like a different kind of animal in this big <laughs> Creative Cloud family. So, but it's so cool, especially for me, I really love working After Effects and make, making things move. So um, let's see. Yeah, I love how you're such an explorer here. You're so adventurous, you know, from one tool to the next and then with in the adventurous uh, space of space. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. That's that's very true. You know, I I like to think of myself like being an explorer just because like, you know, my portfolio it's so diverse like Typically when people ask me, what do you do for a living? It's like so hard to explain because like I have to start with photography because it's like, it's my first love, my first passion. But then, you know, I have to weave in all of this other passion that I have. And um, I think at the end it becomes interesting once you get to know me and my work um, mm -hmm. with the amount of, you know, little things that I'm embedding throughout this um, journey. <laughs> Okay, so, oops, we see the glass here. That's not a biggie. All right, so I'm just um, going to import our um, glass that we designed into After Effects. And I'm just gonna create a composition, new composition from the selection. Okay, let me just increase. Okay, so this is how it looks right now. Um, our background is transparent, the way how we design it in uh, Photoshop. And, you know, what I'm gonna do right now is, so we can see that the glass, as I shot it, has some sort of liquid inside. But what I want this liquid to do is to animate it. So at the same time, when I shot the steel, I also shot um, a video. 
and I was softly blowing over the, the liquid inside the glass to cre create some sort of waves, some ripples, uh, just to make this a bit more interesting and just to give to the entire experience a bit more texture. So I'm just going to overlay that video um, over this um, glass that we have right here. And then we will do some magic. So let's see. Okay, so let me turn this over. I shot it vertically, so I need to turn it around. Okay, so again, the colors are pretty flat. I'm shooting video uh, with a flat color profile as well. Um, so we need to do a couple of things here. Do the color correction and the color grading, then um, mask the area of the liquid that's moving and overlay it on top of the glass that's still. And then on top of that, <laughs> we're gonna use a still image of a galaxy um, courtesy of um, NASA imagery that I'm gonna show you. And that will be reflected inside this liquid that's gonna move. So that's gonna be really exciting. Wow, I love this. And I love how like, I can imagine you there blowing over the glass, like your part, photographer part puppeteer almost oh, yes. with creating some of these like I know some people in the chat were talking about the cookie I guess the, the cookie as you know is, is such a the floating cookie if you haven't seen it it's a floating cookie over a glass and uh they were asking how you did that was that with a, a string yes it was with the string uh, I know lots of people they get so excited when they see that uh, I have different techniques depending on the cookie um I think they are referencing the cookie over the um, glass of meal that I did with Adobe in January. That one was with a string just because the cookie was so small and light, but I did another with a chocolate chip cookie that was a bit chunkier and heavier. And for that one, I used a stick. So it depends on you know how heavy your object is. You start to think and you know problem solve how you can make it you know float. Um, but I think it's always exciting to see this thing like magic. Oh my God, it's floating. How is that possible? Yeah, um, amazing. You can still direct uh, objects even though they're inanimate. Yeah. And I think here you can see the straw. It's peeking through just a tiny bit. So I was blowing through the straw. I didn't want to get too close because I wanted the waves to be pretty subtle. So, you know... I was like just close enough to blow through it and the, the air to reach the liquid. So this is the behind the scenes. So now we know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me see. I'm gonna just trim this video to the part where I know that the waves are kind of uh, nice enough. Probably to somewhere around here. Let's see. And I'm just going to play it so I can see exactly what's happening in here. And <clears throat> we, we don't need this to be too long because um, we need to export it. And we need this to be uh, light enough for Arrow. We don't want the um, AR experience to feel too heavy because then it will take some time to load on your phone. And um, so basically, I'm just going to extract one second of this motion and that's why I need to just like watch the clip and see exactly the the part the portion that it's the waves are the most perfect because it's just going to be one second but in arrow we can make that loop so we'll have like perpetual loop and it will feel like it's so much longer than one second so let's see now it's we have buffered over two seconds and uh, Ferry in the uh, chat is asking, do you have any tips on shooting process? So we, you can stitch all of them together easily and seamlessly later. It sounds like shooting flat, of course, helps, gives you a little bit more latitude later. Any other tips there? Um, if you are shooting video, always use a tripod. I think if that's the number one rule, if you want to have, you know, steady motion, you can always 
stabilize it with After Effects or Premiere, but it's always best to have things right in the camera. So have the tripod, have the right lighting. Um, you can shoot with whatever color profile your camera has available. If you can shoot flat, fine. You can come later on um, in you know After Effects or Premiere to do the color correction. Um, and just maybe plan the shot ahead. Just think about exactly what do you want to be the end result. If it's a cinemagraph, what do you want the cinemagraph to do? What's the part that you want to move? Is that complementing the still portion of the um, scene or is it overtaking it? Um, so usually like even with this glass that I did here, like I had a very specific idea in mind. I knew that the angle of these to be like bird's eye view. I wanted the inside of the glass to be visible. So I kind of had an idea more or less about how this needed to look before starting. But you can always, always experiment. If you don't know immediately what you want, you can try a couple of things, then go back. If you have like one day where you can just experiment and play, uh, you can just, you know, do the, the play around this. I think that's how I initially started um, like experimenting a lot and um, testing. Like if I see that this is not the right angle, I will just go back and shoot it again. Um, someone in the chat is, uh, Rick is asking if it would be possible to see the layers while in After Effects. Um, the layers, what layers? The layers of, um, these are the layers. I'm not exactly sure um, what layers. Ah, sounds good. All right. Um, so I think I like this portion here. This, you see like the waves are kind of circling around the glass. So what I'm gonna do before doing the mask, I'm just gonna do the color correction, the exposure correction. So I'm gonna use the Lumetri color to do that. So typically you would start with um, exposure. You want to make sure the exposure is right. Kind of feels fine. A little bit of contrast. Maybe a bit more highlights. Typically, I'm blowing out the shadows. I don't really like the, the shot to feel too dark. Um, and then this is pretty much what I do. I don't do much. But the next thing that I think is the most important is to um, use the, um, the key color and uh, separate the colors that you want to enhance over the rest of the scene. So let's say for this one right here, and it feels a bit fuzzy just because I am playing with the um, resolution here. So I want everything that's blue to be more vibrant, but I don't want the yellows to be affected. So typically I'm just um, selecting the colors that I want to feel uh, included. And let's see, this will show in the mask. So right now we see that the areas in the photo, in the video that are um, blue are captured. And right now with this capture, we can go in with the sliders and make the blues feel more vibrant. Uh, we can increase the saturation. And uh, this is a nice way how we can um, make things um, be color corrected. So let me open the sliders here. So we see here that because I chose these two particular colors, we only have this um, here selected. I'm just gonna denoise this just a tiny bit and blur it. This will make colors blend a bit better. And then I'm gonna go to the color wheels and make this feel more blue. The goal is to have the motion part match color-wise in the same way with the still image. 
I'm always using the still image as my reference point just because, you know, a still image, it, the pixels don't move. So of course you want that to be your, your hero. So then, you know, the, the motion part will be complementing that. So we want them to feel like they're part of the same story. So whatever we do here, it has to match um, our still image right here. And sometimes I'm just turning layers on and off just to make sure that it's going there. Say maybe the mid tones, more cyan, just a tiny bit. I really like this process just because it feels like you can change things so much without doing much actually. So you can, you know, transform the way how things look in just a few clicks. Yeah, absolutely. You can give it that, that cosmic feel, uh, very subtly already. Yes. Um, I can also increase the contrast over here if I want the sharpness. Typically, I will add just a tiny bit of sharpness to videos just because the pixels are moving. So I want the steel and the moving part to look like they have the same amount of sharpness. Let's better see the colors. Okay, let's check the mask. Okay, so if you feel like, you know, you didn't really capture the colors that you wanted or it's not the entire spectrum, we, you, you can always come here and, you know, just extend the color reach so you get, you know, the entirety of that color captured in your mask. You know, almost like here, let me go. Because it's almost like a gradient of colors, just it's not just one color and that's it. So we want to make sure that, you know, the entire spectrum of these yellows and oranges is, is nicely captured. Okay. Right. Now let's go and blur things just a tiny bit. And color wheels. I really love this part because it's like everything is suddenly transforming. Yeah, it Let's almost see. reminds me of uh, working with Crayolas from the crayon box as a kid. Yes. <laughs> this place going and selecting your colors and just nudging them a little bit. Yeah, so we already see the difference, like over here where the liquid was catching light. Um, so everything looks so much better already. Okay, mm -hmm. so now we have this. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna switch here the 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 modes because I want the blending modes to come through, and I want these to blend with the glass. So. Or before doing that, maybe I should go ahead and do the mask. Okay, so let's see. Pen tool again, you see? We need it. And I think what's really extraordinary about the Adobe tools is that you can do the same you can you know you have your workflow and you can replicate it in all of these apps so it's like i kind of did the same thing in photoshop right but now i'm doing it in after effects and i think that's really cool yeah that's the fun of being able to play with the, the different apps and then just explore try different things out and uh, it feels like the people who do the best at uh, augmented reality are those people who are into playful exploration across tools. I think a lot of people wrongly think, oh, well, you, if only people who are, do 3D right now are successful in AR. And I think you kind of prove that that's not the case. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, people feel intimidated when they hear that, um, you know, maybe the trends online, you know, you see lots of people doing 3D with 
um, AR, so they feel intimidated. But um, I think there are so many other ways where you can have fun and really do your your artwork and incorporate AR into it without going that route. And there is so much more we can do with photography and to do to the uh, images that you know people should explore that and just have fun. Lots of fun. Absolutely. And because you start with that realism, when you blend it later in augmented reality overlaid in the real space, it actually is believable, right? It it really does look real. It doesn't start in the digital space, but it starts out in photography. It starts with that realism that makes it integrate into the world even better at the end, I feel like. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. That's why I love it. I feel like there is so much potential that one can explore there. And um, that's how my portfolio started to be so multidisciplinary, just because I, I, I felt, you know, I was interested in this and that. And I felt so passionate about discovering these other disciplines that I said, you know, nothing, no one can keep me from, you know, incorporating motion into photography if I want to do it. So, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, you are an artist, it's your voice. If you are true to that and you can make it be innovative with the tools we have today, that's the best you can do. And that's extraordinary because we have so many tools. Yeah, it feels limitless. And because there's no rules in some ways, you know, there's of course guidelines and stuff with design and best practices for design in general. But uh, augmented reality, because it's like an emerging field, it doesn't feel like the rules are clearly defined. So uh, the best way to, to have fun is just challenge them and try new things out. Because I feel like the artists like you today are going to be the ones who define the field tomorrow. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Uh, so right now I'm just trying to match these um two pieces together so I'm immediately I immediately see that you know the video is not as sharp as I want it feels very soft so I'm just gonna add just a tiny bit of sharpness um, to it just because it bothers me already so typically I'm just adding like 30 or 40 percent sharpness it's already so much better like let me turn it on and off so you can see And um, so then what else I did here? Um, so just the scale, I'm trying to play with the scale and I'm trying to align the, the rim of the glass. It's almost there. I feel like it's, it's looking pretty good. Um, and I think now is the time to just go back here in the lumetri panel and maybe increase the exposure just a tiny bit, right? And we can always go into our mask. Um, where is the mask? Why can I see the mask? Okay, sorry. For a minute, I was <laughs> in panning mode. So the mask is here. Um, I want to feather this mask just so, you know, make the video portion really blend nicely with the glass. And because this is playing real time, you know, we see it a bit chopped off, but um, once this will be buffered, we can see really slow motion. Also, this is full resolution. So typically when I want to see the playbacks here, like I will just um, decrease this. And of course you don't see much, but you can see the motion and that's, the important part. Um, so let me just switch it back because it hurts my eyes otherwise. Um, so let's see, like looking from afar to so see if, you know, does anyone know if these were two uh, layers stitched together or it looks real? I think it looks real. Nobody knows. Yeah, it's blending less. pretty well right now. Yeah unless you are part of this show, <laughs> nobody knows. Yeah. Well, and then the, the thing is too, like later on, it's going to be overlaid in the w- real world so that you have so much other competing information that you can actually get away with a little bit more. It doesn't have to be pixel perfect since you yeah. are overlaying it with other contexts, interactivity, um, immersive sounds. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, 
looking at it for so long, it feels like, oh, everything is perfect. So um, typically I'm like coming back the next day and looking at it again, just to make sure that things didn't escape me the first time. And uh, just because it's like you are staring at it for so long when we are doing the masking and all of these, you know, cool effects. And then the next thing, you know, is like you don't, the eye doesn't see that much anymore. So always coming back and checking things the next day. For sure. A fresh eye yeah. <laughs> never hurts. Yeah. Um, so, Allison in the chat is asking, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Romanian, <laughs> right? Yes, it's Romanian. I'm originally from Romania. Uh, so my last name is pronounced Yanku. So the first letter, it's an, it's an I. It's not an L. I know typically people think it's an L, but it's an I. So you pronounce it Yanku, like with an Y, you know. Yanku. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Cool question, Allison. Glad you're here to watch us. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Anyone else have any questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. And if you happen to be on YouTube, bounce on over to behance.net slash live so that you can uh, type your questions and join us in the chat. Yes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So right now I feel like um, everything looks pretty nicely. Um, so at this point, I'm happy with the still. I'm happy with the motion. We have the layers over here. And I really want to add that reflection of the galaxy that I promised you in the beginning. Uh, let's see, probably I have it somewhere here. Yes. So this again will be, this is the image. Let me just zoom out so you can see. Ooh, I love this image. What yes. are we looking at here? So this is, um, the story behind it is really interesting. Uh, this is the darkest nebula we have in our galaxy. So it's just a very dense and dark cloud of dust and interstellar, you know, gas. Um, so according to NASA, this, and this image was captured by uh, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. Um, According to them, this is the darkest and densest nebula we have in our galaxy. And it's very rare to see all of these um, light sources, these stars kind of peeking through just because it's so dense. Uh, the name, it's, uh, they named this uh, coal sack just because it's so dense and dark. Uh, so it's very rare to see all of these light sources coming through just because it's so dark. And, um, but they, they were able to capture this image, which I think it's fantastic. It's, it's really beautiful. It's, it looks awesome. Um, and we're going to use it, this um, blue area, we are going to overlay it uh, on top of our glass. So that's oh, exciting. Love this. Yeah, the Hubble uh, telescope image? Yes. Yes. Oh, nice. And anyone can use these images, right? They're um, on they NASA. Are yeah, they archive. are available. Exactly. And that's great. So you don't have to go out and take a picture of the night sky. You don't have to get a t telescope. Uh, they're freely available to remix because there are legacy, right? Exactly. Exactly. So just hop on NASA's um, website and check uh, their images. They have very cool captures of the, you know, space of these galaxies. And later on, we'll see also some sounds, but I don't want to spoil it for you just yet. <laughs> um, so yeah, just one thing that I just remember really uh, quickly before I forget. Um, so we want this composition to be at 30 frames per second, just because this will be just one second, right? So in this one second, we want only 30 frames. We will be exporting this moving uh, glass with everything that's moving inside as a PNG sequence. And this PNG sequence will be comprised of the 30 images. And um, that will be uh, compressed into an archive and that archive will be later on imported into Arrow. So we don't want this to be like 100 images. Of course, we want to keep this light and nice. And I think the point comes across within this one second, 30 frames. So I just wanted to bring that up in case people are wondering, you know, how long this motion should last for. And I just, uh, also, I just adjusted it in my composition over here because I forgot to do it initially. So it's frame rate is 30 seconds, 30 frames per second. 
Right. It's always such a balance to find like how light to make it, what's enough information to get across the magic without like overloading it or going too far. So it's it's interesting to hear um, your considerations as an artist for finding that right balance to keep things light. Yeah. And, you know, that comes with um, experimentation. Initially, when I started working or like initially with any idea, it comes It's like you, you never know what that outcome will be. So I'm testing all of these ideas and see, you know, is it two seconds too long? Initially, I think I wanted to do five seconds. Then I realized five seconds is like forever. <laughs> so right. then I was like, I think one second should pretty be pretty uh, good enough. So I'm like, you know, one second it's going to be. And then I'm testing this thing out. And then I see, oh, yes, one second is indeed uh, really good. So right now I have my composition and my timeline set to one second. 30 frames per second and I have also this um, image uh, of this uh, nebula and um, so basically what I'm going to do with this again I'm going to draw a mask let me just change the blending mode so we can see what we're doing okay multiply it's too dark let's try overlay or screen so um, the reason why I'm changing this is just to help me um, see all of this at the same time, all of these layers. Okay, this sounds pretty good because I want to draw uh, the mask over this, um, this glass, the top of the glass here. And this is where this uh, reflection of this um, nebula will sit on. Okay, this is it. Look at it. Okay. Um, Ooh, that's right so now, good. Yeah, right now. So, you know, in case it happened to you, because it happens to me so many times, I'm, you know, drawing the mask and then I realize, oh, oops, this is not the area that I intended to overlay. So, you know, just um, with the pan behind tool or hitting Y on your keyboard, you should be able to pan behind the anchor point and move the image inside the mask um, in the area that you feel like you wanted to, you know, be visible. So let me, I wanted these blue stars to come through. So let me just, you know, get there. Yeah, I guess. So I mean, Cedric is asking in the uh, chat, um, if, 30 frames per second is good for one second. What would you recommend for longer sequences? But, um, and I know with some you do like 60 frames per second, uh, some you do 30, but that consideration isn't really based on how long your sequence is gonna be, right? That's based on something else. Yeah, I guess it's based on what the outcome and the tool that you are using. Um, like exactly what you're trying to achieve because um, you'll have different results and different specs depending on what you're trying to achieve. If it's a cinemagraph and you want the motion to be really slow, then maybe you don't want that many uh, frames per second. If you want everything to feel really realistic, you want 60 frames per second because it's concentrating more information in one frame. So you have double the 30, right? 30 is just 30, 60 is double of 30. And, but for AR, I guess it's also the type of motion itself dictating how long you want that to be. I think for me right here, it made sense because, you know, I have this water, this liquid moving that's going to loop. So, you know, it doesn't really make sense to make this five second long if this will, will loop eventually perpetually for how long I want it to be uh, set in arrow. So one second is more than enough to make this loop work. But sometimes one second feels like too short and it feels like the motion is like kind of cut and it doesn't feel like it's smooth and continuous. So I think it depends on the object that you are animating, the motion of that object, how you want that object to be seen in whatever you know outcome you have, like the tool, like if it's a cinemagraph, if it's just an AR experience. So I feel like there are so many factors that come in that it's really hard to find like the perfect answer. Yeah, for sure. And frame rates also depends on if you want to slow something down later. Yeah. Like if you do 60 uh, frames per second, 
they kind of consider that over cranking so that when you slow it down, you have more of that frame information. So it looks crisper when it's slowed down. So it gives you a little bit more latitude sometimes to shoot at a higher frame rate um, for slow motion. Yeah, that's that's the perfect answer, Kerry. And typically I shoot a 60 and then just um, I interpret the footage here in uh, After Effects with the frame rate that I feel like, um, you know, tells the story in a better way. And also because sometimes you have to keep in mind the, the, the weight of the file. So if I want to make it a, um, 30 from 60, then I have that option. Okay, so let's see right now we have we are almost done with the animation part on this. Um, one thing that I see right away is that, of course, we are having this still image plate on top of the glass and the liquid is moving inside here. But I really want this, you know, galaxy, this nebula to move at the same time with um, the liquid. So a very cool way to do that is to create some ripples. And there is a ripple effect here in, after effect, that's really cool. So basically we will apply this effect on top of this image and mimic or simulate the same kind of waves that the, the video has here. So because now we have blending mode hot light, once this will be animated, it's gonna look like this is how it was captured in camera. So I think it's gonna look pretty magical. So let me do it, I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna increase the radius to maybe close to 100. We immediately see that the picture is like rippled. I want the center of the ripple to be, I don't know, somewhere up, just because I want the waves to feel very organic. So I want them to kind of disperse once they reach the glass over here, the mask. Um, next. Uh, let's see the wave width. I want this to be pretty big as well, like probably close to 100. Let me see. All right, so making it just a little subtlety. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. going to see. I think it's going to look really wonderful. The, he the height will be maybe just a tiny bit lower than the width, maybe 80. Okay, so we can see that the mask is almost, you know, taking the shape of a wave right here. And I just want the degree to be like maybe somewhere here. Okay, so let me play it back. And it's not done yet. I still have one thing to do. <laughs> So it's kind of moving similarly. Of course, it's not going to be identical, but it's somewhat similar to, you know, the liquid here. But um, I don't really like the, the fact that it's kind of going overboard. Like you can see that it's um, just spilling over almost kind of like. So typically what I do when I want to um, adjust the mask I don't know if many of you know, I recently discovered this, but I think it's a very cool thing uh, available in um, After Effects. You can feather points on a mask. So we know that here in the mask options, we have the general mask feather and, you know, we can feather it already here and just make the waves a bit more organic. But then like right here, I feel like, oh, I wish I could feather this as well without affecting the rest of, you know, the mask. And we have this very cool feather tool here. If you hold option or alt on your computer, you'll see it. This is feather that allows you to feather just certain areas on your mask. So basically, I don't know if you can see it, but basically it's like we have this line of marching ants that's allowing us to increase or decrease the feathering level of this mask, just in the spots that we feel like um, they should be touched on. So like this, and then I'm adding another point over here because here I want this to feel the entire, um, the entirety of this uh, corner. And then, and I think this is so interesting. Um, it's almost like the brush in Photoshop is just 
um, you know, feathering these these edges of the image just to make things blend well together. And I I think it's just mind blowing that After Effects has this tool and you're able to make the mask fit wherever you know consideration you have for your project. Yeah, it gives you such an element of control there. Yeah, and that's that's pretty hard with you know video processing tools to have so many so much flexibility and to, to give this flexibility to the users like you know because typically people compare everything to photoshop and you know i wish that this tool would have this other thing that photoshop has well i think this is that moment when <laughs> you feel like pretty satisfied that it's here okay i'm curious to, to hear maybe people in the chat if they if they have had the opportunity to work with this feathering tool, if it's the first time they hear about it, like what has been their experience with working with such um, option? Okay, let's see, I'm gonna zoom out. Let's have a look, I'm gonna play it back and see if it's, I think it's gonna look pretty good. And, you know, of course, we'll still have some corners that, you know, they will be kind of spilling over, but um, we can always go back and tweak it. So it makes sense. Let me also adjust this um, center, I feel like. Let's see, maybe. Because like every, you know, setting has something that's gonna change the way how things appear so everything is interconnected yeah yeah and uh, to your question to the audience it looks like a lot of uh, folks are uh, new to after effects here so that feather uh, tool must be uh, a new tip i know it saved me a, a few times for sure oh that's great that's great to hear well you know if people are in just learning with uh, learning AI, AI, it's just just perfect because this is the perfect time to learn a trick like this. Is you know that's gonna save them some hassles down the road. <laughs> so okay, Let's see just a tiny bit here. Oops, that was so much. Think. Okay, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Obviously, you know, tweaks will take some some time to, you know, get things just there. But I have here a copy that I worked on um, before and that looks exactly how I want it. I did exactly the same steps. You can see the ripple and the sharpness. And I think it has that aesthetic uh, that I wanted the, the the wave it's pretty well contained inside the glass and um, the liquid is kind of moving at the same time with this wave so basically this will be the the focal point of our AR experience it's comprised of a still image the, the photo that I shot of the glass, the moving part of the liquid inside the glass, and then the picture from NASA with the um, with a very dark and dense and beautiful nebula. And all of them combined together, this is um, the end result. And I think it's quite beautiful. I, I think it looks, uh, hopefully I didn't stare at it too, for too long, but I, if it, it almost feels like this is how it, was like in real life i know it's mm -hmm. almost impossible but uh, they blend together pretty nicely so it looks pretty realistic yeah it's almost like you also mapped it to the curvature of the glass the nebula yeah. um this is really looking pretty cosmic and and groovy with the ripples and all and it's, and it's interesting that you were able to tap to the nasa sources and i love how you have like this like deep uh rich um, wellspring of other assets that you can tap into. And that's actually, NASA is where we connect. Um, I worked at NASA as an intern for a year, NASA Ames, whoop, whoop. And you did a project recently with NASA as well. 
Yes, yes, that's so great <laughs> to hear that we have so much in common. Yeah, my NASA project, that uh, was a very nice opportunity. Actually, it was back in 2019. It almost feels like yesterday, but um, yeah, just a couple of years back, I had the opportunity to uh, create a short documentary film for NASA. They have uh, an yearly competition called NASA in Space, where they invite filmmakers all around the world to create uh, films, short films, under 10 minutes using images from their archives. So um, I think that's pretty cool that they give this opportunity to filmmakers, you know, students um, and professionals to use their imagery and create, um, you know, new films departing from, you know, these historical milestones that they have. And, you know, the sky is the limit, the more creative you are, the best. So I created my short film was about um, Apollo 11, you know, the, the mission of our first moon landing, you know, sending three astronauts, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles away from Earth and I think two of them set foot on the moon. I think that's, you know, our legacy. And I really wanted to humanize this mission just because it's so iconic. And I spent countless of hours in, you know, in the archives just to find the right imagery and videos, extracting those videos from their original context. Like they were part of news reportings and lots of voiceover that I had to remaster and then stitching all of these moments back together in um, Premiere and After Effects, depending on what I needed to do and um, design the sound design, the soundtrack for the movie. And basically the voiceover was just um, the commentary for the liftoff of the Apollo 11 and then intertwined with voices from the mission control center. Like everything was so authentic and I really made sure to um, follow the historic timeline. I think that's really important how things started like from, you know, preparing and the, the effort that was behind this mission was like extraordinary. And I was so, I felt so fortunate to, to be able to learn about like everything that um, it was needed to be done to bring this mission to be a success. And then the lift off and then, you know, setting step on the moon and everything that happened in between. And um, I think that was a perfect opportunity for me to showcase my photographic eye. I think it's pretty uncommon to see photographers taking on this, um, opportunity to design films um, and it was kind of my dream to to have something created and inspired by by NASA's mission and um, and then the film got selected for this competition it uh, was part of the Houston uh, Cinema Arts Film Festival in Houston and then it got streamed on NASA TV on the International Space Station Australia. On the International Science Space Station. Station. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. To the astronauts, right? <laughs> yes, yes. They, they were so happy to see it. And it's still streaming today, like depending on uh, every opportunity that NASA gets to showcase the, the film they, they do. And I'm very grateful for that. It's just because the timeline of the film, it's so educational, I think. And you get the sense of um, you almost, the, the mission gets so humanized and you get to be so touched by the efforts that were done to make the mission a success. And I think that's an example of how NASA is really working in the field, like really lots of excellence in science and making this space exploration be more accessible. And I think that translates in this initiative, like making the um, the archives available to everyone who can, you know, create something out of them. And that's our legacy, as you said, it's something that we should look up to and try to bring it back to life whenever we have the opportunity. Yeah, and you learned so much along the way in your journey of creation. So <laughs> yes. that's fun. Um, and Nita is asking, um, how do you do your uh, sound effects as well? Um, typically, I'm using Audition, so probably I will make a session about that uh, sometime in the future. I really love Audition. I'm spending lots of time in, in that tool as well. Um, it's, it's a lot of listening because you have to um, see the video, the news reporting that you want to, you know, cut and maybe you want to use just one frame out of that. And with that frame, maybe one, the voice, but the voice, maybe it was a 
other point in time in that video. So you have to listen and watch lots of footage. And I think that was the hardest about this film because I had to, um, you know, spend this time. It's like, it's the time that you have to spend. There is no shortcut about it. And then um, importing everything into audition and just cleaning up everything and um, eventually overlaying that with music. Mm -hmm. And I think the music also has like an important factor in my work. And for people that want to check this film, it's available on my website. You can always go and check. Let me just quickly bring up the browser and just show you how you can check it here under the fine art section, you can see the film. And you can get a sense of these things that I just mentioned. This is the film, you can play it. It's totally free. You can see the entire film here. And you can see, you know, hear the voices, the authentic voices and um, the, the music also. I think it's building up that, you know, anticipation of what's gonna happen with the liftoff. It's, I think it's pretty extraordinary. So whenever you guys have the opportunity, just go and check it out. And, you know, if you have questions, I'm always available to answer. Amazing, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. rich, such a rich experience you have here. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Katie. So what's so next sweet. here for us? So yeah, uh, so probably you guys saw that, you know, this is pretty looking pretty nicely. I'm just gonna export this. As I said, it's a PNG sequence, just um, file export, add to render queue. And here just a few options that we have to keep in mind when exporting PNG. We want uh, the channels, we want to export uh, uh, RGB and alpha channels just because we want the background to be transparent, right? And then um, the format should be PNG sequence. It's really easy. So once you have these settings in RGB and alpha and PNG sequence, you can you know, specify your output location. Let's see. We said it's going to be here. OK, then I'm just going to render it. It's going to be pretty fast because it's just 30 frames, as we said. And it's done. It's done. Now I can go back into this and um, check it out. What's going on? OK. So these are our frames, we have them 30, 29, because it starts at 0, 0. So it's basically 30 frames. I'm just going to compress this easy peasy. Um, and this will be the archive that we are going to import into Arrow. So I guess at this point, we're pretty much done with After Effects. And uh, let me go ahead and um, turn on my Arrow. And let's see how we can make some more magic in here. Should we do a quick recap of um, what we've done so far for those uh, just tuning in? We oh, yes, of course. So let me just um, go back to After Effects. And I'm going to show you this like this. So uh, for those of you who have just uh, tuned in, basically what we did so far was uh, this is a picture of a glass that I uh, shot myself uh, with just one simple light on the left side that I took it in Photoshop. I masked out the glass out of its original background. I did some very simple color grading just to enhance these blue tones of the glass. Then I brought it, I saved it as a PNG um, just to have the background transparent. And I brought it in in After Effects. The next step was to overlay a video that I shot of the same scene where the liquid inside the glass is moving. Um, and then I overlaid this, this video on top of the glass. We did a mask. We, do, we did also color grading, uh, trying to match. I'm going to turn this off so you can see. Trying to match um, the steel with the video. Everything I shoot is flat. So that's why you see colors desaturated and flat. So we brought those colors back to life with um, a few adjustments that I did. Um, and then I added on top of everything, uh, this image of a nebula from uh, NASA's uh, archive that I animated to match the movement of, of the liquid inside the glass with a very easy um, effect called ripple. And then I just applied the sharpness of about 30% just to make things look similar. And this was the end result. 
then I just exported this one second at 30 frames per second composition with a PNG, um, in a PNG sequence with um, channels uh, RGB and alpha included. So we have the background transparent. Once that got exported, um, I just sift the entire uh, folder with our 30 frames. And now we are ready to go and see what we can do in Arrow. Hopefully this that's is where it gets fun. Talk about <laughs> Arrow. We're talking about Arrow space and now we're getting into the Arrow space. So <laughs> oh, that's a good here one. We are. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that, that was pretty good. <laughs> so let's just create a new, brand new um, document here. Um, let's just call it Cosmic um, Cocktail. Mm. So this is going to be some sort of cocktail that's like really celestial. And this is our view in Arrow. For those of you who are not familiar, this is how it looks. Um, but it's pretty intuitive and easy to use. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is really uh, use this import part here that allows me to import um, images. And I'm going to go inside my folder. And I have my archive here. We see that it's almost 90. Uh, 19 MB is not so huge as I think it's just That's very light. Fine. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to wait for it to be imported. And for those of you watching who don't already have Arrow downloaded, it's freely available. So there's no reason not to go and download it either for your desktop or the app, which is available for iOS devices. Okay, so. We have it right here. Let's see, let me zoom in. And um, typically I'm using the um, keys on my keyboard to do the shortcuts for the movement. So one, if you could just press one, it's just orbiting around. If you press two, it's just panning. So if you want to move this um, view and then V will be to select if you want to select a particular object. So I'll be moving with this. If you just see things moving, just know that that's why. Okay, so um, this is the asset that we designed. We see that looks pretty pretty nicely here as well. Um, I, I forgot to mention, but in this one, this earlier example that I did, I also included a shadow. It's just a Photoshop, nothing too fancy. You just draw like a circle that you elongate and you know you do a gradient, really really light blue inside, and that's it. Just again to mimic this kind of 3D vibe uh, because the shape of the glass is kind of already doing that. I, I thought that it's gonna be nice to just have like some sort of shadow at the bottom here as well. So that's the reason you see it. Um, then um, the next step is, so basically we kind of have everything right now. Uh, typically what I would do after I import my assets and this is just the very first one um, is to design the behaviors. So we have this um, little guy running over here down, <laughs> which is our behavior builder button. Um, and here is where we can, you know, start animating and you don't really need any knowledge about doing it. It's no keyframes as in After Effects. It's just like simple buttons that everyone can um, understand and utilize. So basically I'm just gonna start this movement on the on the asset whenever you open the experience you're gonna see this moving immediately so i'm gonna use the start button and then the action will be to play images because we know we have a sequence of uh, images that we just designed that are going to play okay and then here on the right we have a few images so the action is play images, the subject is the glass itself, and then we have some options for the speed. Uh, we can select se uh, seconds per frame. So, um, okay, we can do 30 frames, right? We can do it slower if you want, but we design it at 30. I'm gonna leave it like that. And then we have here the preview button. So immediately we can see exactly what we are uh, animating. So let's just have a quick look. So this was one second, right? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't set the loop mm -hmm. to be infinite. So if I'm just checking this box right here, now if we will preview this, it's just yeah. gonna feel like it's perpetual. Look at that. Yeah. 
So this is kind of the first step. Like I, I hope you guys are getting excited already, just because I feel like it's it's so easy. Like at all, Adobe has made it so easy for us right now. Like everybody else who is not an animator or like three D maker, like everyone else who is working with two D images, and everything is so easy. Like animation, it has not been so easy before so I feel like we kind of have to try it right now just because it's so easy and it's so exciting. Oh absolutely. Yeah I think the behavior builder is pretty intuitive from what people say compared to other tools but if you are uh, an Adobe designer uh, familiar with all the Creative Cloud tools or any of them really it's built uh, to be intuitive for designers. So you don't have to know 3D, though if you do, that's cool too. Um, you'll be able to navigate your way around as well. So uh, some people actually I've noticed have been using this, a lot of uh, 2D designers or traditional designers coming from UX, uh, UI, um, photography everywhere, uh, like to use Arrow as a way to dip their toes into 3D and start looking at their uh, stuff in space. Did you f find that it helped uh, you reconceptualize your work to move it around in space like yeah, this? Yeah, especially like with commercial work. I, I found myself in a situation once like a few months ago where I, so I had some prototypes of some products and I was trying to plan my scene, my photographic scene around it, how I'm gonna, you know, style this product and how big the product is gonna be. I haven't seen the product in real life. So I have these pictures and what I did, I just created a very simple AR experience. I just wanted to see this product in real life. So I, I used Arrow to do just that. And I think that's awesome because it gave me a sense of, you know, how the product was going to look inside this photography scene I was planning and, you know, the scale and everything. And I think that was awesome. It's like, it feels almost like, you know, these uh, science fiction movies we see as like, things are taking off so quickly and everything feels like already so futuristic. I think that's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, now, oh, I wanted to mention something, but I forgot anyways. <laughs> It will come back to me. So now you see that I uh, switch my app to Dimension. So what I'm gonna do is to, so our glass over here, I think it needs a little something. It's just by itself, it's not doing much right now. So this, this entire experience, I want it to feel cosmic and celestial. And I want to design some very cool planets that will be orbiting around the glass. And they will have, you know, sort of different behaviors. We will be adding a few over here and they will do similar things, but a bit different just to create that um, almost celestial vibe. Like, you know, look at this very cool kind of cocktail that looks so, you know, cosmic and then it's your you know, it's so close on your desk if you are using the AR experience to see it in your environment. So for that, I'm using Dimension. And, you know, we have so many uh, starter assets here that we can use. We don't really need to start from scratch. So I'm just gonna use this sphere over here. And again, we see that we have the same uh, controls tools as in um, Arrow. And um, basically what I'm going to do is to, I'm going to add materials, like some sort of, you know, images that will go across and around the, the sphere. And these images uh, will make these planets to look really cool. And for this I have, let me show you, I'm going to bring up the images that I have prepared. Again, uh, these images are from NASA, captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. They are doing a wonderful job capturing, you know, beautiful things in our universe. Uh, let me show you a couple of these images that I'm going to use for our planets. This one, um, it's really cool. It's basically uh, the transit of Venus across the surface of the sun. Uh, this was captured in 2012, I believe. And um, I think it's pretty rare just because this occurrence is not happening so often. So I think it was a pretty um, nice um, event to witness and they capture it so beautifully. So we're going to use this image to wrap around our sphere and make a planet out of it in dimension. 
Um, another one is this one, again, like a very dense cloud of interstellar gas and dust, uh, a nebula that uh, Hubble Space uh, captured. I think it's so beautiful, like all of these stars and, you know, these clouds of, you know, cosmic gas. I think it's really beautiful. Um, another one yes. that I really love is this one. Oh, look at that. <laughs> yeah of um, Helix Nebula, I believe it's called, and I think it resembles a giant eye and I love it. The colors <laughs> are so vibrant. It's almost like the giant eye in the sky that's watching over us. Yeah, kind of. the giant eye in, of Mordor in <laughs> the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It's so much friendlier. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think it will wrap nicely around our spheres in dimension. Um, let's see another one. This one has a cool story. So basically this is two galaxies colliding. Um, this uh, collision started, uh, if I rem remember correctly, uh, around 100 million years ago and it's still happening. So basically what we're seeing is just two galaxies colliding uh, and it takes forever for them to collide. And these light sources that we see are basically neutron stars or some sort of black holes that are kind of pulling gas off of nearby stars. So they are like really bright and heated. And um, during this collision, it appears that, you know, once two galaxies collide, more stars and supernovas are born. So I think it's really interesting how long it takes for things to happen in the outer space and that you know, we are able to see it today and know that such phenomena is still occurring. I think that's really extraordinary. Yeah, it's wild. It's wild seeing them. It's like a collision in slow motion. So very exactly. fun to, to see this. And I love that these little details are just embedded in your objects that you're creating right now. Yes. Thank you so much, Kiri. So uh, I, I always love to kind of, I think it, maybe it's because I'm creating so many still lives and typically with still lives it's you see so much symbolism right and I love to incorporate these little nuggets of um, you know information or things that people might not expect and then when they hear about them they appreciate more the the entire experience so yeah okay so let's see let's go back to work we have our sphere um i'm just gonna you know click over here and we have the option here to incorporate a file a picture but before doing that what i want here in dimension we have the opportunity to select uh, a type of material what we want this sphere to be like we want it to be made of uh, of glass, of plastic, of metal, or other materials. So I want this to kind of feel like it has some shine to it and um, it has some texture. And then on top of that, I want to add these images of uh, these um, nebulas and stars um, I just showed you. So I don't know, let's try with this metal. I think it looks pretty cool. Let's experiment a little bit. Okay, so this is the material that was applied. And um, the cool thing about Dimension is that you can change the light source and you can make it look a bit more sunset-y if you want the light to feel a bit warmer. So we're going to have a look at that as well. Nice. But yeah, first... Anika was adding, uh, asking when we do we add the behaviors? And right now we're in Dimension. So we'll be adding those behaviors when we hop over to Arrow, I imagine, right? Yes. Um, for now, we have added uh, behaviors, just the glass. So basically, it was just the glass. Um, I uh, selected like to start the motion immediately as you see the experience and that action to be play images because we have our PNG sequence of images that we designed in After Effects. So that's the only behavior we have for right now. And right now I'm, you know, designing this planet and we will be adding those and those will have a bit more um, motion as well so this is the the first planet let me orbit around look at this Oof. so this is the basically this picture that i showed you with the two galaxies colliding and this is how it looks um i i think it's pretty nice i'm using um these images as a material just because i want the image to wrap around 
the sphere without any other issue. So I think that's looking pretty great. I'm just gonna change the light. I feel like these studio lights don't really work with our cosmic vibe. I want something warm. Let's try this one. No, don't like it. Let's try forest. Oh, wow. Okay, this looks cool. awesome. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and this is really interesting because this is where it's good to know what kind of context that you'll be setting your object in at the end. Because if you can like mimic that sort of lighting, like say you're going to have your object in nature or in the studio or wherever else you imagine you're going to place it in real time, uh, this is a good place to add that um, those lighting references. So uh, it looks natural when integrating. I agree. I agree. I totally agree. And I want this to probably you'll see, I want the reflection of the light on this to feel pretty natural as if you were outside, even though you might be inside, but just because the entire experience is kind of cosmic, I just want to have that kind of natural light in it. And I just went back to the sphere and clicked on the material. And I just want the glow to be a bit more intense because it was too transparent, I guess. And um, just for the image itself to come through a little bit more. So right now, you know, our forest light is not coming through as much, but it's there. And I think it's just making this image to look even more 3D than it's actually like all of these um, ripples inside this kind of awesome. It almost makes me like kind of wanting to peek inside. <laughs> it's like creating some ses sense of depth. Um, so this is basically our first planet. And um, just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through all of the planets that I have planned for today. I have them already designed, but um, the rest of the planets that I will be importing into Aero are done in a similar way. So let me just go ahead and import those just because I want you to see how I'm adding behaviors to them. So again, I'm gonna use the import um, button to import these um, planets. Let's see. Um, wait, where are they? Let me find them, sorry. Okay, so we have right here my planets. I have um, this red one. I think this is the one that we um, designed. Oh, and one thing before I forget, like um, once you design it and you make it look the way you want it, the way how to export it is pretty um, nice. It's really streamlined with Arrow. So basically you go to file, export, select it for Arrow. So what this does is just optimizing the 3D assets specifically for Arrow. And then your export will be a .glb file that you can easily import into Arrow. So that's like so easy. I, I, I don't think it could have been easier than this and thumbs up to Adobe for streamlining this entire craziness because I know with Arrow and 3D files, you can go crazy pretty quick. So many formats, so many considerations there. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. It can get uh, complicated really fast. But the thing that is nice is that it plays well with other Adobe tools. And so if you have, say, uh, files already in the cloud that you've created from other uh, uh, authoring tools, whether they're 2D or 3D, uh, chances are you will you may be able to bring it in uh, to Arrow pretty easily. Yeah, I agree. And I think I read it somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, but um, they were saying that 50, more than 50% of the mobile users in the US uh, use AR at least weekly, at least once weekly. So I think that's really mind blowing. And um, I think the, you know, we are moving slowly towards making AR the future. And I think, you know, with Arrow today, it, that's just the first step to, you know, having that flexibility to design for the future. And I think that's very extraordinary <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, whether you're designing or prototyping for the future, um, and I'll, it seems like it helps give that edge too, because, uh, we've seen product photography, videography in so many different ways that it's hard to create something new that's surprising and novel and makes people like stop in the, from scrolling and actually pay attention. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, that's why I think, um, you know, my work, probably half of my work wouldn't be existing today if I wouldn't have had technology to create it. And I think that's extraordinary because we are able to do so much today with technology and, um, and you know, we have all of these options. So we are trying to make the best out of them right now and see what the future holds. And I think there will be so much more for the future too. Yeah, so mm -hmm. let's let's have a look at my uh, planets. So just like a tiny bit information on these planets. Um, actually, I want these to be a bit more like exoplanets because of their appearance. Exoplanets are typically sitting outside our solar system, so they don't look our like our planets in the solar system. So I'm not trying to reference any of the planets there. So that's why these look like really colorful and texturized. Um, like this one is red. I think they, they are really vibrant. And that's the reason behind it. I want this to feel really galactic in a sense that this is universal across the universe, not just in our galaxy. Okay, and so right now you see me scaling down this planet. So for scaling down, you can use S on your keyboard or you have here the scale tool, which is basically the same. So I'm just using these controls to scale my planets and position them exactly in the spot where I want them to begin their um, tra trajectory, right? The, the, the motion, so let's see. And as I'm orbiting around this glass, we can see that, you know, the glass is 2D, right? When we look behind it, we see that it's 2D. But then, you know, when you look from, you know, just across like right now, you can see that it's giving you that 3D kind of feeling. And with the planets coming just right above it, I think it almost looks like I can place this planet inside the glass, <laughs> almost <laughs> like. Like an olive, <laughs> little planet olive. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so let's just add some behaviors to this before adding everything else uh, so people can see. So for this, basically, since they are so beautiful, I want them, again, to start at the beginning of this um, experience, and I want them to spin. I want them, since it's a 3D object, I want to be able to see all the sides. So I'm just going to start with the first action to be spin. Uh, let's see, maybe y axis is the way to go i think because of the way how these images are wrapped around the sphere so we might want to try different axes but i think y it's a pretty good uh start and i think everything else we can keep it duration two seconds easing in and out maybe infinite loop let's see and let me just um look at this it's already mm -hmm coming together. So you see how easy it is to create animation with Arrow. You don't need any keyframes. Uh, this is a picture of the giant eye that I showed you. It's spinning. You can see all the size, uh, sides and looks really nice. Yeah, it's uh, rotating just like a, a planet would. Yeah. And if, if we feel like it's rotating too fast, I think if we go back in here and select the relation, like maybe increase it to three seconds, it will go slower. See it just a tiny bit slower. So it depends on you know what's the vision you have behind this type of things when you design them. Um, and then I want these to also um, orbit. So right now it's just spinning. Mm -hmm. It's spinning on its anchor on the y-axis. I want these to orbit the glass exactly like, uh, as a planet. So I'm just gonna um, select this orbit action. And you can see, like, look look at this entire list of behaviors we have. Like, there are so many options that you can select just to um, animate your objects. I think that's really beautiful. And we are going to test a few of them today. Um, so again, um, our subject is this planet red eye. And then the center, I want the center to be the glass. So this will be orbiting around this. Um, infinite. Let's check it out and see. Okay. Oh yeah. We got rotation, we got revolutions going on. Yeah, maybe it's moving a bit too fast. I don't know. We can always come back here and tweak it. Um, 
it's also hard to know immediately if things are moving too fast or too slow. Once you have all of your assets inside and everything is positioned, then you can come back and make tweaks. Um, just because you never know how things interact with each other and how they look together. Okay, so I, I like this one for now. Let's go back to this one as well. And I want this, um, let me see. So I, I feel like they are too far away right now from um, the glass. So I'm just gonna push them back just a tiny bit. And again, I'm doing this um, preview of the work like pretty often I'm trying to orbit around the, in the scene and see like, um, does it look right? Do I need to, you know, change the position or anything like that? I'm not just looking at this from one angle. I'm always like trying to go around. Let's see. Um, right, because that, that's what someone who is actually viewing it would do. And that's like exactly. the nuance of being an augmented reality. They're not just watching it face on. They have the option to kind of uh, go back and forth and pan around it. Exactly. Um, so for this one, let's maybe change things up. So instead of starting with the start action, I will do a tap. So whenever you will be seeing this, you will need to tap the red planet in order for it to do something. So just to give it a bit more, you know, spice <laughs> when you're viewing this in your own environment, if you want to play around with it. So again, I want the same thing, like everything has to spin. Where's the spin? um let's see if we are spinning this on x y uh, x um axis how it's gonna look infinite so you see it's not doing anything now if i'm clicking here mm -hmm. that's a nice little surprise yeah so these are just some of the things that you can do i think it's pretty easy to preview exactly what these actions are doing and then let's make this one bounce. Let's just play around and see exactly, you know, what this doing. So we have different type of uh, settings right here. We see what the action is in the subject, but then we have some offset settings that we can utilize to make our object bounce. So I would say I want this to bounce on the Y axis for maybe two centimeters upwards. Um, I want the movement to feel linear and then I want this back and forth. Let's see. Okay. I'll click. Oh yeah. That feels really natural. And that was pretty easy to implement. Yeah, exactly. It's like in a couple of clicks, you, you get your animation. Maybe I want to do this infinite. Let's try it. So it's just bouncing on an infinite loop it's mm -hmm. almost like a ball at yeah. this point and depending on the height on the axis that you choose right now we have uh, y axis like it's just two centimeters up um you know that the motion will be different if it's like going all the way maybe to 10 centimeters upwards or downwards um so you can always come back here you can also move it on other axes maybe let's say Three centimeters on X axis. Let's see. So it's creating a different type of motion, whereas the, the trigger is the same action. So I think that's interesting because there are so many um, controls that you can slide and make this feel, you know, even more um, original because nobody would expect maybe this to do that and it kind of feels like it's bouncing off of the rim of the glass but if i'm like spinning around i can see that it's not even touching the glass but we can always go back like if we want to make um this feel like it's sitting closer it's like really move it maybe here. Yeah, there's a lot of control here but if you're like moving fast you can do that and then you can come back in and then readjust everything together some people like to do that spatially or you can add each thing in um, and get really like nuanced and detailed about uh, the behaviors and triggers yeah exactly let's see i'm gonna click it and it's oh, so yeah. nice like when you see them like this other one it's like 
um, revolving around the, the glass and um, it's like almost intersecting with this one. Oh yeah, that, that's fun. Add some drama to it. Yes. Gonna crash almost gonna... colliding, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, let's add another one. <clears throat> I want to have like a bunch of planets over here and just make them do different things. Oh, look at this one, this is huge. So again, to so scale S on your keyboard. And I feel like, you know, this type of animation right now feels so much um, easier and faster than even After Effects because I feel like the tool itself is doing it for you. As long as you know what to tell it to do, then it's the action will be done like in a matter of seconds. So whomever it's like scared to start with Arrow, they shouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely. The trick is in uh, how you prepare your assets ahead of time and whatever other tools you're using. Yeah, and there's a lot of starter assets too to get started. Like if someone um, just wants to see what's possible first, uh, I've seen a lot of scenes just come out of folks playing around with the starter assets. Absolutely. It's like even like today right now we are using this sphere, which is one of the starter asset in dimension and we have also here in arrow so many things that we can use to just make things look um, different so right now i have this another planet here um just gonna do the same thing i'm gonna start spin and then um orbit and maybe we can use, I know that Arrow had a release recently where um, a couple of things have been improved and a few features, new features are available. Um, I know that right now we are able to uh, choose our um, pinpoint directly from the desktop app, whereas before we could do that only from the mobile app. So I think that's really interesting. So right now we have these uh, layers that we are able to select as our center, but then we have this button over here that allows us to create a pin. So the pin was added here, let me zoom in. So we have it over here and we can move this pin in the same way it appeared here in the layers panel, in the same way as we would move any other assets in the scene. So we can select it. We can place it exactly in the spot where we want this planet to orbit around. So in case I don't want the glass anymore to be the center, I can make that to be anything else with this pin that I can freely move around. Right, or you can have multiple orbit points. Exactly, maybe here there is another planet uh, or star that's like hidden and you know, right. this other planet is orbiting around that. So it's like, it has some I think, moons. yeah, <laughs> exactly. So let's see. here which one was it was this one so um, we have the center pin one let's see infinite let's see how this plays so we can see that it's like just moving in this uh spot over here because this is where is the the pin and we can see here there is a um very tiny indicator where the pin is actually placed we can see this um, here in the previous scene, but you won't see this once you experiment the, the scene in real life. So this is just for you to get a sense of where things happen in the scene. Um, and then I think it's still moving too fast. I, I want this to be at, at eight seconds. See, it's like almost like mm -hmm. slowing down. So it's like 10 seconds of this one loop and then it starts again. So it's like perpetual moving. And um, this is one of the reasons that I actually wanted to learn AR and Arrow because it feels like, you know, it's like my cinema graphs, like with cinema graphs is like, you, you have to have these perfect loops for the, the moment to be there and mesmerize the viewer. If the viewer sees the behind the scenes, how you did it, and if like the loop is glitching and it's not really synchronized, then the magic is not there. And I feel like with Arrow, you kind of achieve that like, oh, so quickly. And I feel like it's making so much sense for my work because I was already doing it. It's just, I was doing it with different tools in different, um, you know, in different technique. Yeah, absolutely. And you're gonna add sound to this too. 
Yes. So for the sound, um, I want to um, incorporate an MP3 file that has a really interesting um, story to it. Um, sorry, let me go. Maybe I'm going to apply it to the glass. So we have an action for adding sound over here. And uh, that is play audio. It's really simple. And uh, we can select from here the clip that we want to add. And we also have some audio presets already embedded within the tool that we can uh, utilize in case we don't have any sound of our own. Okay, so oops, I just want to add it. Okay, so this is the uh, sound that was added. The volume, I'm gonna keep it at 100%. And um, so let me see. Um, I think I can just share the preview of the sound without uh, doing anything on my end. Let me just make sure that you guys can hear it. Can you guys hear the sound? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sounds so like let me... Cosmic Times. <laughs> Yes. What are we listening to here? Yeah, the story behind is really interesting. Um, this is basically the sounds from around our Milky Way galaxy. Um, NASA, this uh, has been captured by NASA. They found a way to translate the radio waves uh, from the outer space and quantify that in the form of a sound, the process that's called sonification. So that's extremely cool I'm really um, like mind blown by you know the technique how they you how they even were you know capable of extracting something like that because we know that you know the space doesn't really have a sound because of the vacuum of the space but this doesn't necessarily mean that the universe is silent nor empty so there is definitely um sound going on they just found a way how to do it and this is the sound from around the milky way um if i remember correctly i think it's from across almost 400 light years you know across oh. the milky way they captured this across this time span and i think that's really extraordinary yeah that's pretty amazing. And then transferring it into something that sounds beautiful, organic, uh, very cosmic. And you're taking uh, advantage of dimensional sound here in Eric. Exactly. exactly. Uh, what I'm going to do right now, I'm just going to um, show you how this experience um, looks in real space. I'm just going to uh, switch to my phone and I'm going to show you the, um, the final um, experience of this uh, cosmic cocktail directly in my um, room right here. Oh, this is perfect for the last five minutes. <laughs> yes, this is the reveal. So right now I have my Aero app open on my phone. The phone scanned the surface of my desk over here. Let me move this glass because- Drum we roll, folks. Yeah. We're about to <laughs> see it in action. What we've I'm been just gonna, towards. <laughs> I'm just gonna place the anchor of the, the glass just over here top of the coaster and this is how you know the app sees the entire experience in my environment this is my desk right here believe it or not <laughs> you can see it live and we can also go you know inside the experience and tweak the planet exactly as we did on the desktop version so we have that flexibility always uh, to create um, AR experiences directly from the phone and then we have the preview button that's basically showing you the entire experience mm -hmm. live right now. Oh, from that's magic. My desk. And we see the beautiful shadows. And yeah, can you, can you just like tilt uh, left and right around that? Wow, look at that. Real time, folks. Real, Real time, time with the sounds yeah. from around our Milky Way. And you're able um, to tap it and some actions happen as well. So it's interactive. Yes. It's immersive. Look at these planets. And you're able to um, go around it and capture it all if you want to. Yes. So I hope this uh, session was really inspirational to many of the folks that joined us today. And um, I hope they uh, learned something. And um, um, and I hope you guys got excited seeing this. Yeah, I I know I'm uh, not only excited to play around an arrow, but thirsty for a cocktail now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes, our cosmic interstellar cocktail. Yeah, now, um, what are we going to be seeing tomorrow? So tomorrow we are going to experiment with some of my still lives, almost stepping inside these little stories that I created for you guys. And we're going to see more of these behaviors we designed today, but with different assets, uh, more of a photography kind of uh, scene um, that's going to come alive in our you know environments tomorrow as well. So hope you guys can tune in for tomorrow's session as well to see that magic happen. Yeah, now that one I'm particularly excited about. This was really fun too. But tomorrow it's almost like a frame. Imagine a frame that uh, that's on a wall that you can step into. And almost like in a museum. It's like yeah, <laughs> but like a, a diorama that pops out at you. So it's pretty exciting reveal that we have tomorrow. So definitely would want to tune into that. And um, feel free to bring your questions tomorrow too if you go. Uh, after this, if you try out Arrow, download it for free, and you have more questions as you get started, ask us tomorrow. Yes, that's so exciting. And today's session was excited as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, if Were there any other questions from folks who are... To... Okay. Well, okay. thank you all, and uh, hope to see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, tomorrow folks.